So in this video, we're gonna talk about how particles move in and out of cells through either passive or active transport. So let's first think about how particles naturally move. They naturally spread out. They naturally move away from areas of high concentration and toward areas of low concentration. Uh, probably the easiest example to think of here would be to think about somebody spraying perfume. At first it smells very strong in the area where it was sprayed. Gradually it spreads to kind of equally around all areas of the room. And so it, it, it moved from high to low concentration. Um, just like a ball rolling down a hill, if it helps to draw diagrams like this in order to predict particle movement, um, think about the, the top of your hill being the area of higher concentration. And so if it's moving from high to low, it'd be just like a ball rolling down a hill. Um, sometimes a fancier term we like to say is it, the particles are moving down their concentration gradient. And that's just kind of another way of saying they're moving from high to low. And so sometimes cells want to let that happen, and so we call that passive transport. The cell can be passive. The cell doesn't really have to do anything in order to let particles move in their natural direction. And so there are kind of three types of passive transport that we'll talk about. And really all that is, is different about them is in some cases they might be different particles um, that we're considering, and in some cases they might be moving through different parts of the membrane. So our first type of passive transport will be just diffusion, or sometimes simple diffusion. And so that's just any time a particle that can move from high to low concentration just by going through the phospholipid bilayer itself. So maybe you remember from our previous video, uh, that would be particles that can go right through the phospholipid bilayer. Uh, small nonpolar particles like oxygen and carbon dioxide. Um, so let me draw uh, maybe a lot of carbon dioxide building up in the cell. Um, because maybe the cell is doing lots of cellular respiration. So there might be a lot of carbon dioxide inside, but not very much out in the blood because the blood's constantly taking it away. And so maybe the, uh, through simple diffusion, because carbon dioxide is a small nonpolar molecule, it would be diffusing out of the cell in passive transport. Um, the second type of passive transport would be facilitated diffusion. It would just be any other type of particle that has to use a transport protein in order to move from its high to its low concentration. Um, that might be um, like glucose, uh, the sugar we have to bring in in order to do cellular respiration. Um, so what if there's a lot of sugar in our blood, because our blood should constantly be, de de be delivering sugar, um, but there isn't very much sugar in the cell because it's constantly using it to do cellular respiration. So maybe that glucose would be moving through passive transport through a transport protein from its high to its low concentration gradient um, through facilitated diffusion. So notice here that um, sometimes particles might move out of the cell, sometimes particles might move into the cell. This isn't a difference between in or out, this is uh, what is that particle's high and what is that particle's low concentrations and it will just move in its natural direction. The third type of passive transport will simply be osmosis. And osmosis is just kind of a special case. It's the uh, facilitated diffusion of water. Maybe you remember from the previous video that water has to go through a transport protein as well, um, but water is kind of a special case because it's sort of the molecule dissolving all of these other particles. And so you'll see I have a lot more to say about osmosis in a different video um, because it's kind of a special case. Okay. Um, so this is just trying to uh, remind you of one other thing, that if we're thinking about any particle other than water, um, we don't really have to worry about any of the other particles' concentrations to predict which way a particular particle might move. Um, so um, what I'm trying to show here is that maybe the green squares, um, if their high concentration is outside, they'll move from high to low into the cell. Um, whereas the black circles, their high concentration is inside the cell, so the black circles might eventually move um, from high to low out of the cell, um, both through passive transport. And so, again, uh, the green squares don't really care what the black circles are doing, um, and vice versa. You can just think about any particular particle's concentration, and they'll, if they can, cross the membrane, they'll move from high to low concentration. Okay, so sometimes cells don't wanna let that happen. Sometimes cells are interested in keeping particles concentrated either in or outside of the cell. 
And so they might actively work to push particles from low to high. Um, this is kind of the opposite concept. Again, if you can imagine that, that hill that I drew, maybe with high and low, this would be like rolling a ball up a hill. Um, they won't naturally go up the hill. We're going to have to invest energy to push that ball up the hill. And so likewise, we're going to see that active transport requires transport proteins and it requires that we add a phosphate from ATP to energize those proteins so that they can push the particles against their concentration gradient. Um, an example here might be these little triangles. If we were really interested in concentrating them outside the cell, then in order to push them outside, we would need to spend some ATP. Um, why might cells be interested in doing this? Sometimes cells can do useful work when particles are particularly concentrated in some directions. In some other cases, they might just be interested in bringing in as much of something as possible. Um, for example, plant cells and the roots want to bring as many of the soil minerals as possible, so they often use active transport to do so. Two other types of active transport, because they also require ATP energy, is any time we need to bring in very, very large particles. Um, so large that they couldn't possibly fit through the phospholipids or through the transport proteins of the membrane. These are macromolecules themselves, usually, like proteins. Um, they might have to um, uh, push against the membrane and essentially push a whole little piece of membrane uh, maybe into or out of the cell, and eventually the little bubble of membrane kind of uh, uh, pinches off, and then the rest of the membrane kind of collapses and kind of forms the membrane again. So um, this little picture here, if we were to imagine it going this way, this would be like a particle entering the cell. If a very large particle enters the cell, then it would be endocytosis, endo meaning into the cell, cyto. Um, and if a very large particle were being released from the cell, it's exiting the cell, um, then it would be exocytosis. And I hope you can imagine kind of the opposite happens. Uh, maybe a bubble of membrane carries the particle, it hits the membrane, the little bubble becomes part of the membrane, and then the, the giant particle is released. All right, so in this video, we just tried to talk about the basic difference between passive and active transport. Active transport requiring ATP, passive transport not. Um, and then just this idea that with these two types of transport, a membrane can effectively create different environments inside versus outside the cell, especially active transport. And that's an important part of the cell keeping conditions uh, uh, correct or, or spending energy to maintain homeostasis.